Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you all can hear me okay. Yeah, can you just uh, get a thumbs up if you all are? Yeah, oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Smitha Nurona, and um, I'm one of the staff at Bible College. Uh, so I'll just be leading us in today's um, talk through today and then through all of the questions. Um, before we begin, would someone be willing to open us in prayer, please? Okay, maybe I'll call on somebody. Sorry. Um, um, Anand, would you be willing to open us in prayer, please? If you're able to join it. Okay, Jeffina's raised her hands. Okay, thank you. Jeffina, you can go ahead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the time of mentoring hour that you have given us, Lord. As we gather together as students, help us to uh, learn a little more about you. We ask you to open our spiritual minds and our spiritual ears and eyes to listen to you. And in the end, we give you all the glory and honor, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So uh, I think last week uh, there was one question that um, that was asked uh, that didn't get answered. So we'll first just look at that question and then uh, continue with today's session. Um, the question was, how do you build your patience as a leader, especially when the people that you are leading are not listening or cooperating? Um, so I'll just share uh, my thoughts, and then if anyone on uh, staff, uh, any of our faculty want to add, uh, please feel free to do so. So the question is, how do you build your patience as a leader, especially when the people that you are leading are not listening or cooperating? Um, so yeah, the, since a leader, one of the main things is to be able to get other people to work together with you on whatever the goal is. Uh, one important thing is to uh, understand what is it that's keeping people from, um, from being supportive or from being cooperative. Are they uh, lacking the vision for what you are doing or um, are they in some reason, for some reason, not happy about something? Uh, so understanding what it is that is um, that is keeping them from getting on board with what you are working on. Uh, and the best way to do that is to, of, of course, meet with those people, address it with them directly, uh, and talk to them about what is it that they are finding uh, challenging or what is it that they are not uh, what they have, what is it that they have not understood about what is expected of them? Um, so understanding uh, what the issue is, and then once you understand it, then taking the steps to address it. So if it is a lack of understanding of what is required of them, then to help explain, to give them the direction, the motivation, or the instruction, or or even maybe the learning that they need to be able to do what they need to do. Um, but uh, if it is something where they are not happy with something that you are doing, then look for ways if uh, if there is something that you can change about what you're doing in the way you're leading, uh, to look at ways to do that, to change uh, the way you're leading in that situation. Um, but on the other hand, if it's just an unwillingness to work with you, then uh, to give them the freedom to leave that assignment to leave that project uh, because you can't lead people who are unwilling to be part of the team uh, and so to allow people who in that case to uh, step out of the 
whatever the project is that you all are working on is also a good thing. Um, so those are my thoughts. I hope that answers your question. I think Rin had asked this question. Um, any is anyone on staff would you like to add to that? Uh, nothing from my end, Smita. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rin, did that answer your question? I think you had asked that last week. Kind of. Okay. Do you want to uh, kind of, uh, is there something specific you're looking for or something else that you uh, want to ask? You're welcome to ask. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, um, so we'll go into today's uh, topic. Uh, so we're looking at rest, and um, and I'll share a little bit more about why I wanted to talk about this topic and uh, what scripture says about rest. So let me just share my screen. Mm. Okay, so uh, why we're talking about rest? So I think um, it's it's a topic that has definitely come up um, in more recent years. Uh, people are talking more about the importance of rest within the church, um, and uh, but it's still not um, very commonly talked about topic because uh, we are all so busy uh, trying to achieve something, right? There is this idealization within culture itself of uh, staying busy, staying productive, achieving as much as you can within uh, the least amount of time, or uh, even having these goals that, OK, before I turn this age, I want to have done all of these things. And so um, we have these big goals. And usually, it involves working a lot towards that. Uh, so rest is not something that is considered important, uh, that is even recognized as something we should think about. Um, and, um, and because of that, uh, we see that uh, there are a lot of consequences of a lack of rest uh, that have affected us without us recognizing it as um, as a church or even uh, as people in general in society. Um, we hear about so much uh, sickness, so many young people having heart attacks, uh, even seemingly healthy people, right? People who are going to the gym, who are in the gym and they have a heart attack while they're working out. So, um, so just recognizing that um, that even though we might be doing all of the uh, what is considered as healthy eating, healthy exercising, all of those things, uh, thinking about how much rest are we giving ourselves overall, and um, are we allowing ourselves to be uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually healthy, uh, so that we can continue to serve the Lord, continue to uh, do what God has called us to do um, for as long as um, as we are here. Uh, so just a few uh, things uh, that have been found from a lack of rest. Um, a lack of rest can uh, result in a compromise of our health and a compromise in our quality of work. Uh, so the longer we are working, the heavier our workloads are. Uh, that adds a significant amount of stress to our bodies. Um, so uh, there was a study done. But this is in the US. And 36% uh, of workers uh, talked about experiencing chronic work stress. So that means they are constantly under stress. It's not a day or a month or a week, um, but 
constantly experiencing work stress, leading to anxiety, insomnia, uh, muscle aches, increased blood pressure, weakened immunity. Um, and uh, that kind of stress can also further lead to heart disease, diabetes, depression. So um, that, that lack of sleep or the one, the thing of constantly working um, can lead to a small thing of, say, not sleeping enough. And then from not sleeping enough to, uh, to having body aches, from there going to heart disease. So it kind of piles on and adds on and um, uh, snowballs into something that is a lot bigger than what it started with. Um, also, when people are exhausted, it affects their uh, relationships with people. It's more likely that when someone is tired, uh, that they mis misread or misunderstand other people's intentions. They are quicker to uh, be offended. They are quicker to project negative motives on other people and uh, and then respond negatively to others because they think that people are against them for some reason. So um, that also comes from a lack of rest, uh, from being overtired. Um, and then uh, finally, also the spiritual implications of a lack of rest. Um, we see that God created both work and rest. So both of those things are a blessing from God. Um, but when we don't take the time to rest, we uh, we don't take the time to be with God because resting uh, resting is about uh, just enjoying being who God has created us to be and being with God in that time of rest. Uh, and so when we don't uh, learn to have that rhythm of work and rest, uh, we often are not giving that kind of time to enjoy God and enjoy his presence uh, in the way that rest will allow us to. Um, so with that, we look at what scripture says about rest. Uh, so rest began right in the Garden of Eden, um, right after God created. So we read in Genesis 1, 31 to 2, 3, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Um, so we see here God resting. Um, does anyone think that God was tired and needed to rest? No, right? He he didn't need physical rest. He didn't uh, need to take a break. He chose to do that. Uh, so it automatically puts value on rest, not as something that you do just because you have to. Oh, I'm physically tired, so I have to rest, or I'm mentally tired, so I have to rest. Rest is something we choose to do as a part of the rhythm of life. Of uh, Just as I choose to wake up and work, I choose to rest uh, just as a rhythm that is healthy and good for me. Um, and in this rest, uh, God, uh, just as God blessed us with work and gave us that as something that we can contribute to, something uh, that is uniquely um, handed to us as something that is a responsibility for us to carry out. Rest is something that we take on just to rest in our worth in God, to say, I am worth the rest. Uh, I'm worth uh I'm worth this blessing of just being. I don't have to always do something to be worthy of uh, worthy of respect, worthy of uh, people's um, whatever it is, people's attention, worthy of God's love. We are not seeking our worth in things we do. It's in that rest that we um that we establish our self-worth that we remember that our worth is not in the things that we are doing uh, it is in who we are and who god has made us 
Um, so from here, uh, from the Garden of Eden, uh, the next time we see um, see this rest talked about is in Exodus, and this happens after the Israelites have gone through. So we we go through uh, we go through Abraham, we go through. Um, Jacob, we go through uh, Isaac, all of these uh, people, generations and generations, Joseph going to the pro going to Egypt, um, and then the Israelites becoming slaves, and they have gone through the worst experience, right? So they've been in Egypt, and um, at that time, the way days and weeks were counted in Egypt was that uh, it was a 10-day week. Um, and the Israelites obviously didn't have a day off. So they had three 10 week days in a month. And the Israelites were working every day of those 10 days. There was no day off, there was no rest. Uh, and if they complained, they were given more work. Um, so they're coming out of this situation of having physically labored uh, 10 days a week in harsh conditions. Um, and God tells them to take a day off. Okay, so that is something that's like totally outside of anything they can understand, right? Uh, what does it mean to take a day off? What does it mean to take a break, to rest? Um, so we see here for the first time uh, God commands it in Exodus 16, 23. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Uh, this is God's instruction to them about uh, picking up the manna daily. So they do that six days a week. And then on the seventh day, he says, um, don't go out and pick anything. This is a day of rest. So stay at home, stay indoors. Uh, rather, uh, instead, on the sixth day, you go out and you take extra uh, for the next day, something that they were forbidden to do for those six days. Uh, on the sixth day, he says, do that. And so they do it. Uh, but on the seventh day, some of them still go out, right? And uh, obviously uh, make God angry at the fact that they can't trust in him. Um, but this is from that working everyday mentality. They don't know how to stop. And it, it's just like, can we trust God with this? Can we? Um, just stay indoors and not take anything. Will the food get spoiled like it did before? All of those questions. Um, so Exodus 28 to 11. Now, uh, this was something for me as I was preparing also that uh, just hit me that the Sabbath is actually part of the Ten Commandments. And um, we would never ever think to throw away any of the Ten Commandments, but somehow the Sabbath is something we have so easily forgotten. Uh, and we we kind of like never think about do we do this as as a, an individual um, as a follower of Jesus? Do I ever like think about one of these commandments, which is uh, to remember the Sabbath day? Uh, so yeah, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so we see here the Sabbath is um, a day that is blessed uh, as a day of rest for us and also as a day that is to be set apart for God, uh, a day when we are um, worshiping God through our rest. Um, so uh, the word here also for us to take note of is remember the Sabbath day, something that we have failed to do is to remember it. Um, and somehow God, I think, knew that uh, he needed to put that word in there because we would forget. Um, 
And then lastly, we'll just look at Jesus's example of resting. Um, so we see in the New Testament, Jesus did talk about the Sabbath, but oftentimes when he talked about it, he was talking to correct, um, correct, especially the Pharisees and Jewish leaders, because they had so forgotten what was the purpose of the Sabbath. And they had made it uh, something that was uh, rule based, something on which they placed their identity as Jewish people. Um, without remembering the heart of God in it. And the heart of God is uh, for mercy, for uh, for our good, right? for our benefit. Um, but that was not the way they were looking at Sabbath. And so um, that's what a lot of Jesus' teaching in the New Testament is on the Sabbath. But we're looking here at more how did Jesus uh, talk about rest, or how did Jesus himself rest? Um, in Mark 6, 30 to 32, uh, the apostles come back uh, to Jesus and they tell him all the things that they had been doing, all the work that they had been doing after he had sent them out. Um, and his response to them is, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. So we see here, Jesus is actually saying there are needs, there are people coming, they're not giving you a break. You need to step out of this uh, place and go away to get rest. Uh, we don't see him saying, oh, there's so much need, don't stop working, uh, keep serving, keep uh, preaching, keep healing, keep doing all of these things. He himself is affirming that uh, the disciples need to take a break and need to get some rest. Um, and then Luke 8, 22 to 23. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came. So we see here Jesus himself in the middle of the storm. Like that, that could have been the worst time to choose to rest. But he knew what he needed to do. And there was a lesson to be learned in it, of course. Um, but choosing to rest, whatever it may be. If it's time to rest, it's time to rest. Uh, and so Jesus did that. OK, so um, there are different kinds of rests that we uh, can look at. So there's a spiritual rest. Uh, rest. So uh, this is um, coming to salvation in Christ, like receiving what Jesus has done on the cross is a form of resting, where we uh, say that we're not going to any more depend on our own works, on our own righteousness uh, to be saved, but we rest in what Jesus has done on the cross. And so Hebrews 4, 9 to 11 talks about this rest. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did uh, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Um, and then another example of spiritual rest is a rest, uh, which is uh, a form of just um, expressing our confidence in the Lord. Isaiah 30, 15, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. So there is a form of spiritual rest uh, that uh, that is important. Uh, there's also emotional and mental rest. Uh, I won't read all of these passages, but um, all of these passages are talking about rest for our souls, right? Um, resting uh, from um, resting from anxiety, Psalm 37, 7. Do not fret because of him who prospers in this way. Uh, so just being able to uh, quiet in ourselves to uh, to be like Psalm 23, those sheep who completely trust in their shepherd to take care of all of their needs, uh, who don't have to keep striving for something, striving for uh, to meet our daily needs or uh, striving to take care of ourselves or our families, uh, but just being able to be led by the shepherd um, to rest in 
uh, in the blessings that he surrounded us with, uh, to just reflect on all that he's done for us and be refreshed in that. Um, so, and then uh, Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me all you who are labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Uh, so recognizing that um, our rest comes from God himself. So um, being able to lay down all of those burdens whether mental, emotional, uh, that we are carrying and being able to trust God with them. Uh, and then the last one is physical rest, so that rest of actually sleeping. Um, scripture talks a lot about sleeping, right? So Psalm 4, 8, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Um, and then we look at it. Ecclesiastes 5.12, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Um, so, yeah, this, these are just some verses I want us to look at, um, some things for us to think about, uh, that when we are resting, there is a holistic rest that we should look at. It's not uh, just about sleeping or just about not doing work. Uh, it is about resting our whole being uh, because there is healing that needs to happen in every part of who we are. Uh, so some key takeaways, God instituted rest. We see that right in Genesis. Uh, rest honors God. So uh, the Sabbath was give, uh, given as a day uh, to be set apart for God. It's an act of worship to God. Rest establishes our self-worth. So rather than seeking self-worth in our uh, work or in our accomplishments, when we rest, we say, we affirm that we are, uh, we are worthy of everything that uh, God has given us, not because of what we do, but because of his love for us. Um, Rest ensures time to refocus and establish dependence on the Lord. Rest ensures refreshing and renewal. Rest is an act of faith. Um, so yeah, when we're tired and worn out, other parts of our, uh, other areas of our life are affected. And so rest kind of ensures that we're healthy in every way, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. And rest ensures longevity so that we are able to continue to serve the Lord for a long time. Uh, so some applications, uh, look for ways where you can set aside time to rest daily, weekly, and annually. So don't, um, don't wait till you're exhausted after weeks and weeks of working and then just crash at the end of those weeks. Uh, instead, think ahead of time. Think about when you would like to take breaks um, in a month or in a year. And plan your work accordingly, um, but also take time daily and every week, uh, set aside time, uh, set aside a day to just rest in God's presence um, in, in a week. Pace yourself, so plan how you're going to work, uh, know how much you can do, how much you should do, and when you should stop. And uh, the last one, which I think is very, very important for us in the church, especially, is learning to say no. Uh, because um, I think we feel such a pressure uh, when we're in ministry or when we're serving in the church, uh, that everything is so important. Everything is for God. Everything is for the kingdom. And so we have to do everything that comes our way. We can't lose any opportunities. Uh, but um, to recognize that that we need the, that kind of rest, right? Like what we looked at today, and um, and if we are not there to do it, someone else will do it. It's all right, and sometimes it's okay if it doesn't get done. Uh, so just recognizing when when we need to say no, and having the discipline to uh, to prioritize our rest. Uh, to the extent that we say no to certain things, however good they might seem. So that's all I wanted to share with us today. Um, if there are any questions, any thoughts you would like to share, please go ahead.
Oh, Smita, since there are no questions, uh, can I just help Rin with her a question about? Sure. Yes, uh, please. Yes, how yeah. a leader can build a patience. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, you know, the leader should take time for uh, self-reflection just to understand what, you know, triggers or what they react to uh, in terms of their own, uh, the situations they face and, you know, what tests their patients. So just to understand their own uh, triggers and their reactions and uh, uh, the reasons why they become impatient. So that's one thing they can do. The other thing is, um, you know, just to take time to assess whether their expectations for themselves and others are realistic. Sometimes, uh, you know, we can have a way too high expectation for ourselves and expect that of others. And when it's not met, uh, then we, the leader can get uh, uh, impatient, can get uh, frustrated. So to just see if the leader's goals are um, something that is attainable, something uh, or whether they are expect what they're expecting of others is also something that is attainable. And then if it's not just to adjust their expectations uh, so that they don't get impatient. And another thing they can do as a leader is uh, to work on improving their own communication skills, uh, just to be very clear uh, about what they are expecting, the work that needs to be done to provide the information that is easily understood by the team members um, and also, you know, uh, to delegate those tasks and uh, appropriately and also trust the team member to carry out their responsibilities in the way that they would like to do with their own skills, with their own, uh, uh, you know, creativity and not micromanage everything. Uh, because when you do that, then we get, uh, the leader can get stressed and impatient uh, because it's not being done the way they think it needs to be done and the way they want it to be done with their own creativity, their own skills and their own understanding. So don't micromanage, just uh, delegate the task responsibilities, but ensure that what you want, the goal or the, the outcome uh, is clearly mentioned. And, uh, you know, ways, things can be done in different ways, but the out can, can, outcome can be the same. So, uh, you know, uh, that's very important. And also, you know, take time to um, cultivate a good um, uh, rapport uh, relationship with the team members. So when you are giving them feedback, uh, you know, it's well received. If there is no relationship that is built and you're giving a feedback, then it will not be taken uh, well. And also, it's important to ask your team for, as a leader, to ask your team for uh, uh, feedback about uh, the uh, the leader's leadership style so that, you know, you can uh, improve. And I think this way uh, a leader can um, develop their own patience. And uh, because you answered the second part of it, I thought, let me just uh, answer how a, a, a leader can build uh, a patience. I hope that helped, Rin. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, Rin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Selena, for uh, addressing that that first part. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions? Or if we don't have any questions, I think we can close and everyone can get some rest. And then you and That was a good joke. <laughs> that was a really good one. At the beginning of the day, to get some rest. <laughs> and we have a long day to go. Thank you, Sita. Okay. Thank you all for joining. We'll see you next week. Sorry. Nancy, would you like to add something? Yes, sorry. Please go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, I just uh, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was uh, very thorough. And, um, uh, you know, taking us back to the understanding of rest uh, as far as, um, you know, the scriptures are concerned. Uh, but my um, 
maybe it's a question <laughs> question is yeah. more regarding uh, the balance between work and rest because mm -hmm. um, yeah rest is very important but then like when we look at the way god created us the seven uh, day week of creation he worked six days and then mm -hmm. he rested on the seventh day so you know there seems to be a balance there and also the fact that when god created adam and eve um uh, it was part of his design to assign them work. So work was very much part of the perfect world. Yeah. It wasn't a burden or it wasn't, uh, you know, something that uh, originally man uh, would not need to do. And then suddenly um, the world got corrupted with sin and uh, therefore work came into the picture. Work was a part of the perfect world. So, uh, yeah, Smithasa, any thoughts about or comments rather about like, work and rest and the balance between yeah. the two yeah i guess e even the other faculty if there are any thoughts yeah can you share thank you thank you yeah that is a good um a good observation that rest came at the end of six days of work so uh you have to rest from doing something if you're not resting from doing something then you're just being lazy so uh so just to um to affirm that, yeah, God, just as God uh, had given us rest as a blessing, work is also given to us as a blessing. And um, and it is so that we can uh, serve his world. We can uh, be stewards of all that God has created. Um, so learning uh, that rhythm, right? So we see in even in the seven day week that it was a rhythm of six days of work and one day of rest. Uh, so having that kind of mentality of I work, uh, I work for a certain period of time and I do all that uh, needs to be done uh, and then I take a break. Um, I complete my work and then I take a break. Uh, but then obviously sometimes your work doesn't get completed within that week or within the certain hours that you have but having that kind of a rhythm of working and then taking a break working and then taking a break uh so this my encouragement through this was to just remind us to take that break every um whether it's a daily or weekly break uh whatever it is um but to of course say that we should be working hard the rest of the time. Uh, the break comes to rest, um, to rejuvenate us um, at the end of those days of working. Um, so uh, the other thing is to recognize how long, so ever, that talking about pacing yourself, right? Recognizing what is a good uh, rhythm for yourself. Now, we can't tell everyone you need to work uh your you obviously have your work um requirements right eight hours a day uh to work at least that minimum uh, but we can't tell everyone how much work they should be doing in those eight hours or you need to recognize what you are able to do what you can improve on how you can work better within the time you have um all of those things so that you can take a break at the end of it and you're not working constantly because you're not unable to finish your work uh, so, yeah, th those are my thoughts. But please, if any of the other faculty would like to add to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Smita. Uh, I do have another question, if that's okay. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I'll post it on the chat. Oh. Thank you. Okay, why does it seem harder for our generation to take time off to rest? Um, I'll share uh, just a few thoughts and then um, if any of our faculty as well um, would like to share, please do. Um, I think we, um, we are very influenced, first of all, uh, by a Western mindset and, and that whole idea of the American dream um, in so many ways affects us as well. The American dream is to own a house, to own a car, uh, to retire, um, 
so th those were some of the things that people work so hard for um, so that at some point they can retire and then relax for the rest of their lives. Uh, and that mindset or seeing, even looking at the, the West and uh, seeing that prosperity uh, is something that the world has just kind of run behind. Um, so it is that desire to prosper in whatever way we view prosperity now uh, we as uh, as people who are serving god definitely don't have that mindset uh, but uh, we have somehow adopted this uh, thing of achieving we want to achieve we want to do more we want to think which obviously is a great thing when we are doing it with a heart for god uh, but uh, we forget our limitations in the in the process, we forget that we are also human uh, human beings, that uh, we have certain physical limits, we have certain mental limits, certain, um, certain uh, things that will wear us out. And we need to, uh, we need to recognize that, that that's something that we forget um, from a ministry perspective, I think. Uh, on the other hand, from a secular perspective, I think it is this just um, just getting more, getting as much as we can, uh, achieving more, uh, reaching. Uh, uh, there is so much self-worth, I think, that is tied to all of that um, on one hand. And on the other hand, it is um, the consumeristic uh, side of it, wanting more, uh, wanting more money, wanting more uh, to own more, um, wanting to earn more money, all of that. Um, yeah, but uh, would anyone else like to add something to the faculty? Yeah, I just want to add uh, just a couple of thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. um, so th thank you for that, uh, for those thoughts, for that study. Uh, I just feel that, um, you know, sometimes <clears throat> just seizing from activity um doesn't equate to rest you know because um, the reason i'm saying is like like even tied to that question which uh, nancy asked you know how, how does it seem harder for a generation because the thing is we are constantly bombarded with information you know whether it's social media or um whatever it is you know we, there's always a stimulus to our minds and even if let's say we're not working we we think we are resting by you know scrolling through you know, Facebook or Instagram, but there is that, especially, you know, if you're going through Instagram, Instagram Reels, and you know, there is a constant bombarding of uh, uh, information, you know, your mind is stimulated. So there's actually no rest, you know. So just seizing from physical activity or the quote unquote, you know, the professional work or ministry work that you're supposed to do. Uh, does not equal, equal, or even, you know, sometimes you say, okay, I'll go on a vacation and I'll rest. The, the thing is that you're carrying everything, you know, with you. You know, like someone said, um, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> you know, that. so your mind is uh, constantly working over time. And there's no, like um, this businessman once he said, you know, I wish I could switch off my mind. You know, I'm asleep, I'm lying down, but my mind is racing. I wake up, my mind is racing. So the thing is to come, you know, even as we cease from that activity, the thing is to come to that place of really um, resting, you know, in the true sense of the word, you know, put away anything that might, you know, stimulate, that might, you know, um, in, in the right, uh, I mean, if, if it's a stimulus in the right way, that's fine. If it's something refreshing, that's fine. But um, yeah, so so those are some things that, actually prevent us from resting, truly resting, uh, I would say. Um, so uh, yeah, we really need to find that rhythm and also find what works. Uh, and it's a very individual thing. Uh, another thing I want to say is also, you know, when we say take rest, it's not rest from the Lord. <laughs> you know, in the sense, uh, the Bible talks about how seasons of refreshing come from the Holy Spirit. So. And I think the great place to rest is just be quiet in the presence of the Lord. You know, there's so much of, um, you know, uh, rest that comes from the fact that we are in the presence of the Lord and who is the Prince of Peace. And so all these activities and all that's troubling just comes to a place of 
all the storms um, you know, come to a place of seizing and uh, you realize that in that whatever, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour, you're so refreshed, you're so charged. Um, so um, yeah, so rest is also not taking a vacation from God, uh, but really, truly, you know, relaxing in his presence and receiving from him. Uh, yeah, uh, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you, Smita. Thank you, Pastor uh, Jay Kumar. That was really helpful. Okay. Any other thoughts? Anyone wants to share anything? Hey, Smita. Yeah, I just, if I may just very yeah, quickly echo sure. what you just said um, to all the musicians out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the most important things um, in music, besides the notes, are the spaces, the rests. Uh, when we learn music, you know, you learn a lot about the notes and, you know, what to play. And one of the favorite quotes is, a good musician knows when to play, a great musician knows when not to play. So that's about you know, giving space and you're not doing anything. And I'm um, sure most of us know uh, Beethoven, we must have, we would have heard and we would have heard some music of his. And he said, um, the rest is more important in music than the notes itself. And so his... Uh, Famous symphony, symphony number five. Again, we would have heard that. Would have it just start like da 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 da. You know, it's that whole big symphony. The grand symphony starts with the rest, uh, and so and if there was no rest, um, every piece of music that's ever written will still be playing now, and so it had to stop somewhere. So, uh, so for all the musicians out there, from the musical perspective, uh, it's those spaces and those rest that emphasizes and. Uh, it gives more significant to the notes that's being played. And so, and I think we can kind of draw a parallel to a life as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Roshan. Okay. Um, I think we can close. We have about three minutes uh, left. Um, so we can close for today and we'll gather again next Thursday. Thank you all for being here. Have a good day.